What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for a My Week With video. So this week I've been driving around the all new 2022 Subaru WRX. And uh, so I really enjoyed the WRX on my first drive. I was on the launch event uh, back at the very end of 2021 and was very impressed with it. So if you're curious about all the details about the WRX and the basic overview of the car, definitely check out that video. I'll link it above to go watch that. But as far as what it's like to live with the WRX for a week, um, I've really grown to like it even more than I did on the press drive, but it isn't all perfect either. So I'm going to get into all of that here in this video. But um, the things that I really praised on the first drive still remain. You know, it still has fantastic handling. It still was just a very good combination with, you know, having no rev hang, having great throttle response, having a really nice feeling shifter, and you have a much broader power band. So, you know, and that's one thing I really appreciated, especially out here in the real world. You know, whenever I was carving up canyons in California, it was pretty good, although it felt like it was kind of, you know, lacking a little bit, and I felt like I wished there was more power. Now, here it's, you know, I've been driving this vehicle here in February, so it's a lot colder here in uh, Pennsylvania in February. But even with that slight power advantage, possibly, um, this thing still just feels really good, and I'm actually really enjoying the level of power and it is satisfying and it is adequate for a WRX you know I don't think that it really feels slow or anything um, and I really did enjoy it I don't know if it's the most enjoyable thing that this kind of competes with and I'll get more into the competitors in a minute um, but I just I really enjoyed it there, but also some of my complaints still remained as well for example the wooden feeling brakes where the brakes still don't have much feel to them and they just whenever you're leaning on them even whenever you're braking kind of hard you don't get much feedback back from them it's like they're braking but you're not getting much feeling through the brake pedal there and it's it doesn't feel very precise but we're kind of some corners here the same corners I always take in all my other reviews see how this vehicle handles and it handles so so well so it's important to note this one is not on the summer tires which is what all WRXs will come with from the factory since I'm reviewing this here on the East Coast in the middle of winter Subaru has put some Michelin Pilot Sport all-season tires on this instead so still all seasons you know they're not dedicated snow tires so we're still gonna have pretty good handling here the Michelin Pilot Sport for all season is also a very good all season tire it's actually my favorite but I've just noticed that in you know the kind of circumstances I've been driving it in plenty of grip here with these all seasons but just you know it will come down to what kind of all seasons you put on this uh, it's just kind of you know strange that Subaru still does not offer an all season option from the factory and you have to get summer tires for a vehicle that its main selling point is its all-wheel drive capability in the snow but um, regardless, I mean, this thing still handles so, so well. I still love how the steering feels just nice and light, but accurate still. Everything about this vehicle, just whenever you're hustling it, it's rewarding. It's very rewarding to hustle. And I love that, you know, on the back roads of California, there in the canyons, but also here on my own back roads. I really just enjoyed that, but I also just love running errands because, you know, having that broad power band means, you know, you still have good punch at all RPMs. You don't have to redline this thing. I actually enjoy this motor more when I'm not redlining it because redlining, it's still a little bit of a disappointment considering there's only a 6,000 RPM redline. I do wish they had gone for a higher redline, even if it's worthless from a power standpoint. Um, I still wish that they just would have given us a little more breathing room there so um, yeah, you don't have to shift right at six grand to get the most out of it but regardless I just enjoyed running around you know 3,000 rpms and stuff and just loved having that really solid punch there all throughout the mid-range but yeah I also just love this nice short gearing you had here in the Debra X2 and so that combined with not having any rev hang meant that I was just shifting a lot and I was enjoying every one of those shifts and that's what you want for a manual focused vehicle and I mean since 85% of Debra X buyers go for the manual according to Subaru having a good manual experience is really important and so I love that short gearing and uh, so uh, there weren't really any downsides either because even out on the highway that was one thing I was really curious about because I didn't actually get much of a chance to do much highway driving on the first drive so I did a nice little highway loop here and it's funny because you know whenever you're going like 80 miles per hour in sixth gear you're sitting at like 3,000 rpms on the highway and with this exhaust kind of being a little bit boomy at times I was kind of worried that you know it would be a little bit unrefined on the highway there but thankfully it wasn't it quieted itself down nicely even sitting at 3,000 even if you get onto the acceleration at 3,000 rpms there you know it's still wasn't too bad so it's just kind of funny though you would think that also that would hurt the fuel economy but surprisingly fuel economy is better in this than it is in the CVT version which I'm assuming would have a lower uh, cruising speed you know for the engine RPM but 
Regardless, uh, for my fuel economy, by the way, so these are rated, they just recently did come out with fuel economy for the DRX. They're rated at 19 mpg in the city, 26 on the highway, and 22 combined, which is actually one worse than last year's uh, DRX, uh, which is kind of understandable considering you have the bigger displacement of this engine, even though it doesn't really make much power or much more power than it did before. Um, you know, it's understandable that, you know, being a bigger engine, it's going to get slightly worse fuel economy. So as far as my fuel economy here, my average has been 19.7 mpg and that was mostly just around town you know having fun with it uh, i mean i'm not redlining it everywhere but just you know using the turbo and having fun and stuff still to be getting over the city rating in the winter no less and by the way i mean that included i was doing some idling to warm up the car to clear snow off of it and you know all that i was even sitting in a drive through line for a while at one point and so even with all that stuff considered i'm still doing better than the city rating so I'm not sure if this just doesn't test very well or what the case is as far as why, you know, it did lose out a little bit on fuel economy because this motor is newer, it's more efficient. And so I'm just impressed that I'm actually doing better than the city rating, um, you know, given my, my type of driving and stuff. So I'm pretty happy, um, you know, to be getting 20 now again. This is clearly going to be the worst fuel economy option in this segment of stuff it competes with because everything else it competes with basically is front wheel drive um, aside from the Volkswagen Golf Far. But that is another one that's all wheel drive. It's maybe a little bit more efficient. But considering, you know, it's an all wheel drive car with, you know, turbocharged, you know, motor that's, you know, a little bit on the bigger side these days, uh, you know, I'm not too upset about the fuel economy, but that is something you're going to be paying a penalty for over something like a Civic Si. Um, and that is one last thing I have to add about daily driving this car. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. And if I desperately needed all-wheel drive, I would actually buy one of these. I like it that much that if you're in this price range, you know, and you want a manual and you want all-wheel drive, this is really the only game in town aside from the Golf R. I actually, for what it's worth, had more fun driving this around for the week than the Golf R, even though that has more power. It just didn't feel as fast as I was expecting the Golf R to feel. You can go watch that video if you're curious for all my thoughts on that. But so I enjoyed this better than that, which is a testament considering this is going to be much cheaper than a Golf R. But I did notice that I had a little more fun daily driving the Civic Si. That is down on power, but not as much power as it might look like on paper. Because Savage Geese Dino, both of them, and the Civic is underrated from the factory, and the Debra X is pretty uh, spot on from the factory. So you're really only talking about about a 40 wheel horsepower difference between the Civic Si with this new gen version and the Debra X. And so, you know, 40 wheel horsepower is definitely significant. And, you know, if you're someone who wants the fastest thing possible, you know, and you want to pay the few grand more for all wheel drive, and the 40 extra wheel horsepower, go for it. But, you know, Civic Si, I still think I like a little bit better from a value standpoint because it will be cheaper than the WRX, especially when it's comparably equipped with, you know, some of the features that a base WRX probably won't get. It's also going to save you a little bit more money on gas with the Si. You also might have slightly cheaper insurance rates since WRX insurance rates are notoriously high, typically. But I mean, the Civic Si gets like 31 MPG combined. So you're gonna be like almost 10 MPG higher in the Civic Si. And these days, with gas prices being a little bit on the high side, uh, you know, you might appreciate that saving so I would just say if you're considering one of these you don't absolutely need all-wheel drive test drive a Civic Si as well I do love the Civic Si also has auto rev match but you don't even need that it's just that that motor feels so eager and has a little bit more character to it I think than this motor does I'm splitting hairs here they're all very fun vehicles but it's just worth noting that I still had a lot of fun in the Civic Si and you know for a little daily runabout I think it was maybe even a little bit more fun than this Again, if you don't need all-wheel drive, which is the big disclaimer and the big selling point here on the DevRx is the all-wheel drive system. Speaking of the all-wheel drive system though, um, I didn't get too many chances to really test it out on heavy snow and it's still an all-season so I wasn't going to really try and test it very much because if you are going to be driving this through the winter, I recommend just getting snow tires and then keeping the stock summer tires that Subaru gives you. Um, but you know, the all-seasons here did a great job in this you know, cold weather and still plenty of grip. Another advantage the Civic Si has over the DevRx for daily driving is it has wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto, which you do not get here in the WRX. It's still just wired in Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And, um, you know, it's just kind of nice whenever you're just hopping in the car, running an errand, you don't want to have to plug your phone in every time you want smartphone integration. It's just really nice to be able to hop in the Civic Si, have that, and not have to fiddle with any cables. Um, it's a very first world problem, but it just is one area where this is kind of lacking.
lacking. The Elantra N also lacks the wireless smartphone integration, but you know, all the other competitors, the Golf R and stuff also has the wireless smartphone integration. So that is just one thing. Um, and I also don't love this infotainment system still 100%. It's not bad, you can live with it, it's not a deal breaker. But personally, I think that if I'm going to use something, I just, I like the infotainment system a little bit better in the Civic Si as well. Although this still beats what you get in the Golf R, that is definitely um, one of the worst infotainment systems out there currently. But one other little minor thing I was annoyed by with the infotainment system is that every time I'm listening to Bluetooth audio, it auto plays the second I get in the car. Even if I have the volume muted, that doesn't actually turn off the radio, so it's just always wanting to play something in the background. So if you don't, you know, it, it's just kind of annoying because, you know, if you're someone who has a playlist or something and it's playing through a playlist and just not picking up where you left off every time you actually want to listen to music, just kind of annoying. I don't know why it does autoplay. That drives me crazy. And that's not a just only Subaru thing. There's a few other companies that do that. But that's just something that's a little bit annoying. Um, but one positive thing about the infotainment system is it's hooked up to this Harman Kardon stereo, which I didn't have much opportunity to really play around with on the first drive. So uh, with this week here, I was able to actually kind of experience the audio system a little bit more. And the Harman Kardon stereo sounds really nice. It's uh, you know, not amazing or anything, but for this segment of vehicle, uh, it sounded really good. I still think if you're an audiophile and you want a turbocharged all-wheel drive vehicle, I would definitely go for a Mazda 3 Turbo. The Mazda 3 has the best stereo in this segment, hands down, and uh, you know, you just have to give up the manual with that, but you know, I think that if you really do want you know, the best stereo, go for the Mazda 3. So that's the infotainment stuff. The last other little thing to mention is that, I don't know if it's just because this is probably a very early, you know, pre-production car, but there's a little bit of unrefinement at cold. So whenever I would do a cold start, it would have a little bit of a rough idle at times. And it also, uh, there was these weird times where like whenever I was just pulling out of my neighborhood, engine was stone cold and I'm, you know, like in second gear and I'm coasting down a hill, it would almost like bounce uh, and like jerk back and forth. Uh, I don't know what was going on with the engine there, but it just kind of was this weird sensation. Um, and it wasn't like I was going too slow for the gear or anything like you often get with a manual. It wasn't anything like that. It was just like, I'm just coasting in second gear down a hill, shouldn't have an issue. And yet it's like um, bopping me around. So I didn't know what that was about. Could just be this car. Maybe it's got a bad tank of gas or something. I'm not sure. But uh, just one little thing to mention to, you know, kind of just check. Hopefully, you know, the engines in this are all well-tuned for cold weather and stuff. And I haven't seen anyone else, anyone else have any issues, but just wanted to mention, you know, just make sure that, you know, the engine doesn't feel too rough or anything if you're test driving one of these. Also, after I filmed this, Subaru did reveal pricing for the 2022 WRX. So the base model now starts at $30,100, including destination, which is about $1,700 more than last year. If you're okay with less creature comforts, I think this one will be the best value for sure. And at that price, it's less than $2,000 more than a Civic Si for a lot more performance, but you will lose out on some things like a proximity key with push button start, a premium stereo, blind spot monitoring, moonroof, and a few other things. So you do lose out on a good bit. But the premium now starts at $32,600, which is a similar increase of about $1,600, but it doesn't get the moonroof now that it used to get unless you add on a $1,875 package that includes the Harman Kardon stereo. Still, even with that package at $34,500, it's also a decent value considering it's only about $1,000 more than an Elantra N, which has similar horsepower and features, but is only front wheel drive. Um, it is worth noting though that that Elantra N has a lot of extra performance enhancements like an adaptive suspension, a multi-mode exhaust that sounds great, multiple drive modes, launch control, auto rev matching for the manual, digital gauges, and a bunch of other stuff. It also offers a great dual clutch automatic for less than what Subaru charges for their CVT automatic, which is about $2,000 by the way, depending on the trim. So because the Subaru gives you less features for more money aside from from that all important all wheel drive feature, I personally think that uh, the Civic Si and the Elantra N are much better performance values and I'd take either one of them over the WRX. The WRX though I drove was the Limited which is about $37,000 now. And that sounds like a nearly $4,000 price jump from last year, but it does include all the features you got in the $2,100 option package you could add on to the old Limited. 
but it's still a nearly $2,000 jump though and doesn't even give you leather seats anymore. It's just the micro suede kind of stuff. And so the top CVT only GT trim, which adds in the adaptive dampers, Recaro seats and unique wheels, that gets an even bigger jump costing now $3,650 more than a CVT limited WRX. And so that one costs $42,890, which is about $20 more expensive than even a 2021 WRX STI Limited. So clearly, if you want a loaded WRX with an automatic, at this point, the Golf R for only a few thousand dollars more seems like a no-brainer for a lot more power. It has a torque vectoring rear diff, all kinds of cool stuff. If you're open to an automatic as well, the Mazda 3 Turbo is also a great all-wheel drive option with way more torque, 320 pound-feet of torque, only 20 less horsepower, 250 there, um, and it has a way nicer interior. And the awesome stereo I mentioned earlier and stuff, all for under $35,000, which is you know under what you're even going to be paying for a cloth seat premium WX. It's like insane how much nicer the Mazda 3 is for you know so much less money than the WRX. It also though, does not handle quite as well as the WRX, but if you're willing to compromise there a little bit, I still think that's also a way better value than the WRX. But yeah, overall, I really, you know, like my week with the WRX. <laughs> the one final funny little thing I have to mention is I kind of realized about halfway through the week, you know, I still don't love the way the back end looks on this car. I have grown to be okay with the looks. Um, it's something that isn't a deal breaker for me anymore. I love the way this thing drives enough that I would live with the looks. Uh, and it was also just, I just noticed it was funny that all the parking that I did most of the week, I very rarely even saw the back end of the WRX. So I was able to live with it much easier because I'm just like, I totally forgot about what it looked like back there half the time because I'm not seeing it when I'm driving. I'm not seeing it half the time when I'm parked. Um, you know, so the back end of the WRX is kind of out of sight, out of mind. Sure, I'd love to be rolling around in a car that was beautiful from every single angle. That's not the case here. But uh, as Subaru points out, WRXs have never really been beautiful. People always hate the styling every time they change it. You know, and so it's one of those things, I guess they just figured they're gonna do what they're gonna do. People are gonna hate it no matter what. And then people still end up buying them regardless. And so it's kind of a moot point. Um, so just one little funny thing to, to mention there. And I also just do wanna add that, you know, you definitely, if you really want something all wheel drive in a manual, give the WRX a chance. Even if you're not in love with the styling, the drive might win you over, and I think that's what Subaru's honestly expecting for a lot of people. You know, it's worth a test drive. Just try it out and see. I mean, it's not gonna blow your mind. You know, I'm still waiting for the STI for good feeling brakes and for, you know, a really impressive amount of power, but that's always what the STI's been about. You know, this is still very good for just a regular normal WRX, and I think that it's, you know, would make a really great daily driver, a great companion, um, you know, if you're someone who really enjoys, you know, just this whole experience, which is getting, again, more and more rare. I just love that they're continuing to offer a great manual transmission setup and make the WRX as good as they are, honestly. So I'm just grateful this car still exists and still continues to sell well, especially with a manual. Um, it's one of the last holdouts, and for that, I'm incredibly thankful this car, you know, continues on and continues being awesome. But anyway, that's all of my thoughts thoughts here on the WRX. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. Huge thanks to Subaru for providing me here with the WRX to live with for a week. And yeah, thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.